rise now as we go to the confession and forgiveness. On this day of reformation, we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you with all the word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives power to become the children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. Amen. And then as we process in, if you will follow the cross as it moves forward.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. God, gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated for the lessons. The first reading is from Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 7, and it can be found on page 1227 in your pew Bible. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Here ends the reading. The second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 19 through 28, and it can be found on page 1118 in your pew Bible. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 
and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Here ends the reading. Okay, Casey James. And so the people went, wow, look at all that money. 
But you know what Jesus told that man? He said, this woman gave more because this is all she had. And she gave it all to God. Now let, and the man that gave the $60, he just gave part of what he did. Okay? Now, let me tell you about a true story. A little girl named Hattie. And she lived in a city or an area and they, she went to a church and it wasn't very big. And one day when she went to church that morning with her parents, the Sunday school room that she was in, she couldn't get in it because there wasn't much room. But the preacher came out and he says, don't worry, we're going to get you in. So he picked Hattie up because she was little like y'all, carried her in and made her place for her in Sunday school. And she looked at the preacher and she said, one day we, we need a church that everybody's got room to get into. Well, time passed and the little girl died. And her mother came and went to the preacher and said, Hattie has been saving since that day. She said we needed a new church that was big enough for everybody. And here's how much she has. And she wanted to make sure that it got to you so they could help build your church. And he gave him 57 cents. That's what she'd saved. Well, the preacher went into that congregation that day, and what do you think he told them? Here's a little girl who didn't have anything and saved up, and God took her early. She's in heaven now. But she wanted this 57 cents to go build a church. And guess what happened to the church? They raised the money and built a bigger church so everybody had room. So what God is telling you today, remember that everything in this world belongs to God. Okay? We think it's ours, but it's not. So when somebody asks you to give, or if somebody says, or you think to yourself, well, I can't because I want to save that money for an ice cream, or maybe this toy I want, okay? What God's saying it doesn't matter what amount it is, whether it's $60 or a penny, it all goes, give, give what you can to God. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for everything that you have given us. Given. <laughs> and please let us remember that it all belongs to you. And we need to give joyfully to you. Amen. Amen. Okay, don't forget to get your little bulletin. Thank y'all. Gospel appointed for Reformation Sunday is from St. John the 8th chapter beginning at verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And this is the Gospel of our Lord. Okay, 
Okay, dear saints and God, Reformation Sunday, kind of a Lutheran church birthday, though the Lutherans weren't the only ones involved in the Reformation. What's it all about? And that is a very broad and big question, so you're not going to get all the answers, but let me start here. Wyatt Aiken Smart was a late professor at Emory University up in Atlanta, and he he told a story about visiting Hawaii and then climbing this semi-active volcano. And for a long time he said he, he gazed down into the crater and what he saw was this hot boiling mass of lava, and I'm sure you've all seen the pictures. Um, but he soon noticed that a process continually repeated itself. As the hot lava came up, to the surface, the cold Pacific winds would blow over it, and then um, that caused a hardening effect on the lava. The entire surface would soon begin to cool down, and the red would turn to gray, and then kind of a hard crust would develop over the lava. And yet no sooner had that crust developed than tiny red cracks would appear in the crust and suddenly out of the center some more lava would burst forth and when that happened, uh, that breakthrough, the rest of the crust would begin to crumble and the entire area would become red hot boiling lava again. And yet even as that hot boiling lava started to take over everything at the edges the crust started to form again and that process went back and forth and back and forth I think that's a, a very good picture for human culture human culture is in constant change sometimes that change crusts over and the laws and the customs of a land remain the same for a good long time. And things may remain relatively stable for generations even. And it can seem as if the laws and the traditions and the way we do things and live by are set in stone like the crust on the lava. So for a long time there were in America blue laws, right? Blue laws for Sunday which were put in place to limit what you could do on Sundays. At that time you couldn't sell or buy liquor on Sunday for example. Or no little league coach in his right mind during the days of blue laws would ever have thought of scheduling a baseball tournament on Sunday morning. Right? But now you can buy liquor on Sundays. Oh, you might have to wait till 12, but Kroger will gladly give it to you after that, right? And sports tournaments are scheduled on Sundays, even during the morning hours, all the time in all the sports. So societies change. The lava of human desires boils and breaks through and old laws and traditions go away and new laws and traditions are created and in the midst of all of this of course comfort zones are disturbed. Now when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the doors of the castle church in Wittenberg and that would be in the year 1517, he was hot lava um, a struggling soul breaking through the hardened crust of the medieval church. Now Luther was a college professor and all he wanted to do on October 31st when he nailed those uh, theses on the, uh, on the wall was to just kind of invite his fellow professors to an academic debate to d debate about some of the traditions and laws and actions of the church that Luther felt had crusted over over a long, long period and that were no longer helpful to people who were concerned about their souls. 
So in doing this act of nailing up those 95 theses, um, the pressure for change that had actually been building up in Europe all over the place on, on all fronts, political and social and economic, all of that lava was up under the crust of that medieval church and it's kind of its stranglehold on the society. And with Luther's 95 Theses, that was like the first pop through of the lava that began to uh, allow the rest of all of those changes to come through. And all of a sudden, uh, there were a multitude of changes taking place throughout Europe uh, that uh, began to change the hold of the medieval Roman church on over the states, the European states which it ruled. Now, of course, Luther had no idea <laughs> when he nailed those theses to the church door wall that the Reformation movement would spring forth. He really didn't. And it certainly wasn't his intention to tear down the medieval church. But he did, and European history in the medieval church were greatly changed because of it. So what was the fire that made Luther's lava so hot and gave it so much pressure? Well, again, there were a thousand things boiling under the surface in the culture, economic, social, political, but for Martin Luther, I would say what compelled him to take his stand for change were the twin issues of truth and freedom. Truth and freedom. As far as truth goes, Luther, from his study of the Holy Bible as a professor, had come to understand that the medieval church had allowed traditions and canon law, that is church law, and even money, those indulgences that were going, being sold, and worldly power. The church had allowed these things to crust over the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as far as freedom goes, Luther was unwilling to submit his conscience to the church insofar as the church was in error against the Holy Scriptures. And all of that because they had taken this scared little monk and said, here, you're so bright, why don't you go teach the Bible? And that's what he did. He read the Bible and he found out, wait a second, things aren't the same in here as they are out there. You see, Martin Luther's primary concern was for the salvation of his soul. He was a man who had been taught by the medieval church in his age to seek salvation through uh, prayers, penitence, and uh, acts of piety. And yet no matter how much he prayed, or how much he repented, or how pious he worked his works, uh, he could never find confidence that he was saved nor could he shake a deep, dreadful feeling that he was actually hated by a vengeful God. And if you go look at the art, for example, of that age, of what Christ was portrayed as, he was portrayed as a very serious and vengeful judge. Maybe some of you can relate. It's not just that age where people can feel that way about God. Well, only after Luther had seriously studied the scriptures did he come to understand that the salvation of his soul, and anyone's soul, lay entirely in Christ's hands, who had died for Luther's sins, and who offered Luther the forgiveness of his cross in the gospel message that Luther was reading in his Bible. When Luther came to understand that he was actually in a right relationship with God, not because of his prayers, his penitence, and his piety, but by the grace of Christ alone, which was given to him as a free gift to be received by faith alone. 
When Luther came to understand that salvation was that simple and yet that wonderful, he could no longer with a good conscience live in the errors of the medieval church. In other words, when he came by the study of scriptures to see the truth of God in Christ Jesus correctly, then in faith he became free to live in a brand new way. So for Luther, it was about his soul and coming to the truth which set him free. Did you hear the words of Jesus in the gospel today? John 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And of course he's talking about that truth that our sins enslave us and the only way to be freed from that slavery to sin is to come to Jesus Christ and to receive from him the life of God which he gives from the cross. You might also remember that in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth in the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And then in the first chapter of John's gospel, we read verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Truth and freedom. I think this is the core of what started that Reformation movement. And it started in the heart of that poor monk who could never feel secure in his salvation. And when that thing burst through, it literally changed the world. Just as it did in Jesus' day, when it broke through the lava of that old Jewish system, and the Christian church was born. And just as it should in any day, the gospel of Jesus Christ breaking through whatever the crust is on our hearts, keeping us from knowing and loving and serving God. You know, there's so much change going on in our culture, it's hard to know sometime what's up and what's down some, sometimes. It's just uh, crazy. Socialism versus capitalism. You hear the debates? Climate control versus energy needs. You hear the debates? Republican versus Democrat. We all know what that fight's about. Dollars versus Bitcoins. Gee, I can't even put my mind around Bitcoins. Um, Walmart stores versus Amazon vans, and then there's racial strife and the sexual revolution and so much more. In the ELCA, the LGBTQ agenda has basically replaced the gospel. How sad that is. In Germany, the Lutheran church is there. The big issue is not Jesus Christ and him crucified, but climate change. And in conservative churches, you're not going to like when I say this, but I read it. It can be guns as a means of protecting our freedom that becomes the big things. See, the truth is, it's always easy for something, some issue, some person, some political point of view to crust over the gospel of Jesus Christ. But those of us who are the heirs of Luther's Reformation especially, just cannot let that happen. We cannot let ourselves be compromised by the other truths, whatever they be. We, Lutherans, heirs of that Reformation, we can't let that happen. Now, if you were to ask me if being Lutheran still matters, I would say, yes, absolutely. Not because Lutherans are better than other Christians, because assuredly they are not, or because of the way we worship, or even because of our unique connection to the Reformation era. But Lutherans are still important because historically, 
Lutherans have been the guardians of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth of God that saves us from our sins and God's judgment. He is the way back to the Father whose kingdom is breaking into our lives through the gospel. And he is the life that comes down from above and gives us eternal life. As heirs of the Lutheran Reformation, and as a church called Bible Lutheran Church, the one thing we must take our stand on in the world and keep hold of above all others is Jesus Christ crucified for our sins and risen from the dead. Lutherans are gospel people. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, dear Father, we pray that in the heart of every Christian you would implant the gospel of Jesus Christ and help every Christian, O oh Lord, to stand on that gospel with their lives, no matter what comes their way, no matter the many truths of the world. And we pray it in his holy name. Amen. And now we sing the hymn of the day, a metrical version of Psalm 46. Please rise. Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, 
he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the end. Please rise for prayer. <clears throat> Let us pray. O God, our mighty fortress, we give thanks on Reformation Sunday that your holy word continues its work in the world, judging the nations and birthing the church. When we wander from the truth of your word, renew and reform your church by drawing us back to the Holy Scriptures, that we may stand strong in our confession of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And faithful God, we give you thanks for the gifts of wisdom, understanding, faith, and growth, which you grant to those who study your word. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, continue to increase our faith and love that the gifts of your Holy Spirit may be evident in our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
God, our ever-present help, our rock and our salvation, deepen our faith in your promise of salvation and embolden us to be witnesses of your saving grace in our homes, our communities, and to all nations. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give to your church, O God, faithful pastors, teachers, and evangelists who will rightly teach your word in all its fullness and who will bear the cross of Christ in their lives as holy examples of true discipleship. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give to this church, O God, wisdom to discern the paths of ministry you would have us travel, courage to follow what you reveal, and grace to equip us with all things needful to work the works of heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give to the missionaries of Christian Aid Ministries your divine protection as they are held captive in Haiti and threatened with death. Grant them faith that cannot be touched by the threats of the world and the deep and abiding presence of your Holy Spirit in every moment of every difficult day. Thwart the plans of their captors to do evil and bring them safely to the, uh, swiftly to the court of justice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for our sister Anne Marie Mitchell as she seeks new employment and a new community of Christians with whom she can live her Christian life and gifts. Continue to bring healing to her body after surgery and grant her courage and hope for the future. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And hear our prayer, O Lord, for all of those whose needs are known to you, but which lay uh, heavily on our hearts and which we name silently before you now. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have freed us from the power and penalty of sin by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus through the shedding of his blood. As we partake of the body and blood of our Lord in the Holy Sacrament, strengthen and renew our faith in your saving power to forgive our sin and make us righteous through our Redeemer. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we have prayed, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, we bring up the offering and sing the offertory hymn. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Come, in. Come, Lord Jesus.
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. salvation. They can eat the body of Christ for you. The body of Christ for you. This is Christ's body. Give it to God for you. The body of Christ 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 for Thank you. 
the attorney.
God's word is our great heritage.